Earlier this week, an article on Time Magazine's Techland blog made the case for the retirement of the Nexus brand name. The piece was based on a rumor from noted leaker Eldar Mertesin, and it ended by saying that the Nexus brand name itself is due for retirement, because it communicates nothing about the product to those who don't already know its meaning. Well, whether you agree with that assessment or not, it is true that the Nexus line has been through quite a few changes over the years. And since we at Pocket Now have every incarnation of Nexus smartphone in our inventory, we thought we'd take advantage of this month's anniversary to take a look back at where the Nexus line has been and just how that meaning has changed over time. I'm Michael Fisher with Pocket Now. This is every Nexus smartphone from the last four years. So let's see what's changed since 2010. Most product lines that grew to greatness had humble beginnings, and that's very true of the Nexus family. The HTC-built Nexus One, launched in January 2010, almost didn't see the light of day. From Apple lawsuits to U.S. Patent Office refusals to a challenge from the estate of author Philip K. Dick, the Nexus One was plagued with hassles before, during, and after its release leading some to question the worth of the entire endeavor. But the One's specs, including one of the first Snapdragon processors and a then hefty 512 megs of RAM, were meant to showcase Android at its best. The device launched with Android version 2.1 Eclair and would eventually top out at Gingerbread, officially anyway. But the Nexus One, with its unlockable bootloader, was built with developers in mind, some of whom used its powerful hardware to good effect when crafting custom ROMs. The Nexus One certainly bears the hallmarks of 2010-era design. Witness the trackball, rounded sweeping HTC curves, and the 3.7-inch AMOLED display, or LCD, depending on when you bought it. And despite Google's efforts to reinvent the mobile space on its back, the One was destined to remain an artifact of 2010. There just wasn't enough here for most Americans to justify choosing this $529 unsubsidized phone over subsidized, equally capable competitors like the Motorola Droid on Verizon or the Evo 4G from Sprint. And Google shuttered the Nexus One web store just five months after it debuted. At the time, a lot of us thought the Nexus story would end there. So it was a big surprise to many when Google, less than a year after kicking off its first pure Android experiment, followed HTC's device with Samsung's Nexus S. As the name implies, the new phone shared a lot in common with Samsung's then-new Galaxy S line on both the spec sheet and the casing design. A slick black plastic chassis with a bulbous inverted chin and a very slight curve to the glass covering the display, which was, once again, either AMOLED or LCD, depending on market. And though it's only the second generation of Nexus smartphones, we already see the effects of the competition's rapidly inflating display size. The Nexus S screen was 4 inches on the diagonal to its predecessor's 3.7, but one-handed usability was just as easy due to the small size of the hardware. On the software side, Android 2.3 didn't behave a whole lot differently from prior versions, but a slightly darkened and more reserved interface was the first indication of Google's new focus on the UI. It wasn't until the next generation that we would see the company take a truly meaningful step toward aesthetic improvements. The positive aspects of the Galaxy Nexus were almost all rooted in ice cream sandwich. Android 4.0 was the most major overhaul of Android's interface ever, and almost all of its changes, from the new color palette, to the Roboto font family, to the updated multitasking view, to the added responsiveness, were long overdue, and quickly embraced by those tired of Android's ugly duckling reputation. It's thanks to Ice Cream Sandwich that I consider this generation, launched in late 2011, to be the first truly modern Nexus smartphone. Unfortunately, the Galaxy Nexus wasn't such a grand slam on the hardware side. While its build shed the sliminess of the Nexus S and upped the screen size once again to 4.65 inches, the Pentile screen delivered washed out colors and milky whites. Also, the sacrifices made by Google to accommodate a Verizon-branded LTE variant meant that that version did not receive timely Android updates, long a promise of the Nexus brand. In addition, the phone's battery life was subpar, and its Texas Instruments chipset would later come back to haunt Galaxy Nexus owners who were prevented from updating to Android KitKat. Officially, anyway. Before KitKat, though, there was Jelly Bean, and the device built to launch it in November 2012 was the Nexus 4. 
The all-glass smartphone from LG borrowed heavily from the design of the earlier Optimus G, with an IPS display under curved glass only slightly larger but of a much better quality than that of the Galaxy Nexus. Its specs were typical of top-of-the-line smartphones from a year ago, with a Snapdragon S4 Pro under the hood and 2 gigs of RAM pushing along the Project Butter-enabled Android 4.2 at a good clip, as long as you were on Wi-Fi or a capable 3G network, because while the Nexus 4 won points for including wireless charging, it also lost a ton by not offering LTE. But there's a good reason for that. This smartphone was built not just to continue the pure Android legacy of the Nexus line, but to help change what that line stood for. Continuing in the vein of the affordable Nexus 7 tablet, the Nexus 4 was built to be an affordable high-end smartphone. It launched starting at $299 off contract, $100 cheaper than its predecessor's initial price, and more than $200 cheaper than the Nexus 1's. This aggressive pricing completely changed the messaging of the Nexus brand. No longer was it a phone just for Android diehards and developers. Now, Nexus meant lower-than-average pricing for a better-than-average phone. Even if this one did crack pretty easily. The current model, predictably named the Nexus 5, fixes the fragility problem with a polycarbonate back and continues Google's low-cost strategy. It launched last October, starting at $349. The added cost is well worth it if you live in a 4G area. The Nexus 5 offers extensive LTE compatibility. It also does its best to correct a persistent problem with the Nexus line, poor photo performance. The 8 megapixel camera in the Nexus 5 is optically stabilized and does a better job than its predecessors at capturing a solid picture, which it displays on an IPS screen that's followed the rest of the industry into the 5-inch territory. That's par for the course these days, but putting it up next to the first-generation Nexus makes it easy to see just how much has changed. That change is even more meaningful in the new phone's software. For the first time ever, the Nexus 5 incorporates an exclusive launcher in its version of Android KitKat with features you can only find, officially, on the Nexus 5. And that launcher leads to an experience that's not quite as much pure Android as pure Google. That's an important distinction, because today's Nexus is a portal to a glut of services and features, most of which weren't even around when the first Nexus phones rolled off the line. Okay, but so what, right? Ecosystems mature. New features come along over time. That's not unique to the Nexus line. Well, that's absolutely right. And that universal truth, taken together with Google's strategy changes over the past four years, say to me that the Nexus brand is just like any other one. It used to be a line for developers, then it was for the pure Android experience, and then it morphed into an option for the price conscious and the contract averse. And today, it's kind of a funky amalgam of all three. Like Google itself, the Nexus line is dynamic, it changes. But the important thing is, it's always aspirational. Whether it's purity, affordability, or utility, it's always showcasing the very best of what Android can do. And that's why I hope it sticks around. Folks, every Nexus device you saw in this video has been reviewed by PocketNow all the way back to the HTC Nexus One. Check out those reviews at PocketNow.com. Forgive the occasional formatting error for the ones that didn't quite make it to the new format. You can also see video reviews of all of them here on YouTube. Before you go anywhere, though, please drop us a like if you enjoyed the video. Leave a comment down below if you have some feedback or some fond memories of your Nexus device or devices. And be sure to follow us on social media so you don't miss future stuff from PocketNow. This has been Michael Fisher once again. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. We thought we'd take advantage of this month's anniversary to take a look back at where the Nexus line has gone and just how that teleprompter can move faster. We thought we'd take a look back and use the advantage of this horrible sentence to trap ourselves in a never-ending intro that never gets filmed right. This is every Nexus phone ever made, and let's see what's changed in the... <sighs>